Dr. Arthur Needham, who shall be addressing us on the topic, the acceptance of coinage in the marketplace. So some of the protocols of the webinar are as follows. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box and our moderators would take them up after the speaker finishes their presentation. I'd also request everyone to mute themselves to avoid disturbances. Thank you. Over to you, Anindita. Hi, folks. It's wonderful to be here and thank you for the welcome and the opportunity to discuss this subject. Arthur, Arthur, we we are we have yet to give your formal introduction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. Your introduction is not over, so we oh. have to give formal introduction. Yes. <laughs> so, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining in today for our talk with Dr. Needham. For those of you who aren't familiar with his speech, let me introduce our speaker to you. Dr. Arthur Needham is a researcher at Inumismatics and studies proto-history, prehistoric rock art, and coinage of India. He is the co-author of the book, History of Indian Numismatics, and a series titled, Coins of India, the Mughal Emperors, along with Sir Muhammad Tariq Kansari. Together, they have achieved many breakthroughs in the study of coins. They introduced the unit system of coin metrology, a new method of coin illustration, and a comprehensive, Alpha numeric coding system for Indian numismatics. Their contribution also include the designing of museum displays and numismatic coursework at postgraduate level. Additionally, Dr. Needham is involved in a project to publish up-to-date information on the various issuers of coins in India. I will now ask to uh, now I will ask Dr. Amita Palival to say a few, few words. Thank you. Um. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I formally welcome uh, Dr. Arthur Needham um, from, um, uh, from the side of History Department of Jesus and Mary College, and also the Art and Architecture Society, uh, Dastan of Jesus and Mary College. Uh, despite your busy schedule, Arthur, I'm very, very thankful to you that uh, you just on a one request, you said yes. and. Uh, uh, accepted very graciously to share your research along with uh, Muhammad Tariq Ansari, the research you have done along with uh, Muhammad Tariq Ansari, to share with uh, my students and the faculty members. So I welcome you without, uh, you know, wasting any any other any other uh, second. I invite you to speak on, on on your research. Thank you so much. Over to you, Arthur. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm sorry I jumped the gun before. Um, not used to this much praise. Thank you for the welcome and opportunity to discuss the topic. It is in modern terms numismatics and unfortunately numismatics like many other serious studies groups has been somewhat downplayed in meaning where these days apparently a numismatist is anyone who even collects coins. However, to be honest, the field of modern numismatic endeavour, especially in the subcontinent, is open to modern, sophisticated investigation. However, even in recent years, we were decried for discussing economics when discussing coins, decried for discussing metallurgy, and even decried for the fact that my brilliant co-author was starting to be a chartered accountant and secretary when we joined forces. Fancy talking money with someone who was actually going to be an accountant. The old school seemed to be saying that joining with various groups of experts and using modern techniques was somehow detrimental to studying numismatics. But with a team now in action and a great publisher backing us, it was time not only to write but to research and put forward well-researched ideas for further research and understanding. Today, the discussion will start with a slightly updated and lengthened version of my presentation on behalf of Tarek and I, the International Virtual Conference of Museums that was held in June. It is entitled, The Acceptance of Coinage in Silk Road Trade. This is followed by a discussion on similarities to the greater subcontinent over much of the history from the invention of money However, we'll, we'll go back to the start of the uh, slideshow and we'll start that shortly, thank you. The invention of money from reading of books on Indian 
from reading books on Indian numat numismatics, most of which were written by the pucker English Christians, they seem to put some weird context on numismatics and coin to within what the English believed. And what they forgot was that the Indian subcontinent, along with most of Asia, had been dealing with money in a highly sophisticated way for thousands of years. In metrology, we bring forward in our ne next book on the John Paul Sultanate, a series of new methods of discussing numismatics. And I'm running a course at Sri Ram College at postgraduate on numismatics. However, let's go back to the first slide, if we may, and discuss coinage on the Silk Road. One more slide back. That's the one. The acceptance of coinage in Silk Road trade. Now, as I said, this perhaps sounds a little bit odd because we should be talking about the subcontinent. But if we have a look at this particular map, which I've taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica, coming down through the north, through Taxila, right the way to the Bay of Bengal is what they call here the Great Royal Road, although we were taught it was the Grand Trunk Road. And if we follow the total length of the Silk Road from China right across into Europe, there were many types of coins and many types of money that were used in the whole trip. And this is what we need to study first to understand how money and coins were used. Next slide, please. The invention of coinage. Well, we're told that coins were invented around 600 before current era, originally on islands near Greece, and now that has now changed into Turkey. And it replaced barter, because before coinage, we had to barter for everything. And it was originally, apparently, for the payment, what else other than government fees, taxes and charges? The government likes to get their money in everything. But what is the definition of a coin? Because the definition of a coin actually describes what we're talking about. A coin is a piece of manufactured metal authorized by an authority of a known weight and metal that is used as a medium of exchange. So let's not start talking about they found some things in a pyramid in Egypt from 4,000 before current era in their coins. This is the definition of coins that is now accepted in numismatics. And what I say here is that a more thorough research on the subject and date and place of the introduction of coinage may produce a different answer. We may, in fact, find that coinage was uh, invented somewhere within South Asia or East Asia rather than Turkey or near Greece. Next slide, please. What is needed to produce a coin? Now, for people that study the social sciences, perhaps this isn't necessary to discuss, but if we want to look at numismatics technically, we need to understand all of this to fit coins within the social sciences. There is, of course, metal is needed to produce a coin plan. That's the blank bit that things are stamped on a die or mould to produce an impression on the metal, a system to produce a known coin in a known weight. Obviously, although apparently not so obvious to many researchers, to be called a coin, it must be produced in a certain metal and must have a certain weight. And within a coin series, you can have multipliers and dividers. That is, we can have a one unit we can have a two unit or we might have a tenth of a unit because what do we need with coins when we're using money? We need to be able to give change. So if you, you pro produce a one unit to pay for something that's worth two tenths of a unit, you must get change. And also a system that can produce metal, especially the precious metals, in a known and consistent fineness. Was there in history the ability to say, I'm going to produce silver coins 
and the silver coins are going to be 95.5% silver. Where did this technology come from and how long has that technology been? And what's the next thing, of course, how do we stop cheats? Well, we must have a system to check the weight of the coin to see if it's, re it's real and to check the quality of the metal in the coin. And these must be relatively simple to use. Otherwise, other than the king or the ruler making coins, you and I could go and make coins and say, look, this is the same as that and only have half the precious metal in. So we have to understand these points. Next slide, please. So what was available to produce coins? Well, there are a number of types of metals were available to produce coins. These included gold, silver and copper predominantly, but also iron, tin, zinc and some others. And of course, various alloys of copper. Dyes to strike coins could be produced as well as moulds, should coins be moulded rather than struck. That is, instead of getting a, a round or square piece of metal and hitting it uh, with a hammer that had a design on what was being struck, they could be put in a mould and metal could be poured in a mould and everything came out the same. Although somewhat rudimentary, coins could be produced to an approximate weight, even if by comparative weighing against the known standard. Now, what we know is that you could produce a coin, but you couldn't get it 100% correct, but you could get it 95, 98% correct in weight. And all you needed was a little set of scales, balanced scales, you could put a stone of the right weight in one side and the coin in the other. Yes, that's about the right weight. A system existed for the production of metals and alloys that contained a known fineness of metal, especially for the precious metals. That is, they already knew how to make metals of a certain percentage precious metal. And simple systems existed for the checking, the weight of the coin, and again, the finest of the metal. So they had everything from the previous barter trade. Next slide, please. Coinage, a system of weights and measures, it's called metrology. So, so in modern days, you know, we use paper money and we use coins. In, in India, you know, you use a, a, a rupee coin, a five rupee coin, and they're what's called fiat money. Often they, the value of the metal isn't anything near what is stamped on it. However, back in the good old days of hand-struck coins before we had machines or, or moulded coins, coins are manufactured to a known weight, size and fineness of metal. For each coin issuing authority, there is a design that can be replicated within the level of technology, but can be changed at any time. Now, notice I've used the term there, coin issuing authority. Obviously, not everyone could issue coins. You had to be a ruler or a leader to be able to issue coins. And one of the first things a ruler did after coins were invented was to put their hand up and say, I'm ruler. I'm issuing coins, they're my coins. The weight of the coin can be changed at will. The king can kind of send a letter out to the mint and say, I want the weight of the coins made half of this. It could be changed at will, the technology was there. The fineness of the precious metal could be altered to any desired level. I don't want 100% gold, I want 90% gold. That could be done immediately. The fineness of, any, of the metal can be changed at any time to any specific specification. Note, precious metals could be supplied to the mint at any fineness. Someone could give you 50% silver, someone could give you 90% silver. But the required fineness for the metrology of the series produced, the mint could make that fineness. So there is technology and this could happen from the start of when coins were produced. Next slide, please. Here is the interim summary. And why we're talking about this is because coins were used in the marketplace. You went down to the marketplace. If you needed to buy something that was for sale, 
you paid for it in coins. So coins were produced by various authorities along the Silk Road and its various adjacent trade territories. The metrology of the various coins series utilised at the length of the Silk Road varied. Obviously, a coin produced, say, in the Kushan Empire was going to be different to a coin produced in China, was going to be different from a coin produced in one of the many empires in India. The official mints on the Silk Road had the technology to produce coins for their official metrology from any feed material of any similar metal. So if you are in, for example, in Iran, in one of the um, empires there, they could take your silver coins, melt them down and produce them into their silver coins. There was technology. There was technology, no impediment for any coin to be accepted at any place on the Silk Road. What we're saying here is you could take a coin from Greece. You could take a coin into what is modern Afghanistan and you could present that coin and they would know what the current value of that coin is because of the metal in the coin. It essentially did not matter what was inscribed on the coin because it was the weight, the metal content, and the fineness that governed its value at any point. Now, this is highly important. You could take, as I said, a coin from Greece, and anywhere along the Silk Road, you could go along and say, I want to buy five blankets, and they could tell you how much that coin was worth at that time because they could weigh it comparatively and they could test it comparatively. Now, these are quite important points throughout history to understand. Next slide. Reality of coins on the Silk Road. Now, we're going to have to dismiss some myths here. As a researcher in numismatics, there has been a need to dispel a number of misconceptions that were taught to me as a researcher. From this point, a baseline is necessary. Number one, and we'll get back to referring this back to India in the next section. The Silk Road was, in fact, a highly organised system of trade and commerce. So if you started in uh, modern Shanghai or that area and went right across to as far as the Silk Road stretched, everything was highly organised. Along the road, coinage from any issuer could be accepted. The expertise of bankers, money changers and vendors was such that any coin could be accepted as payment at a fair rate. Any coin offered could be easily tested for weight and metal fineness and a test cut or punch could show that the metal was, just, was not just a coating. Now, the emphasis here is any coin could be accepted as payment at a fair rate. Now, in our minds, I don't know, maybe they changed the teaching a little bit recently, but if you read British accounts and French accounts, and Dutch accounts of what happened, and English accounts, what happened in Asia, there were all these rip-off merchants because they were trying to take you down. I wanted to buy something off, and then they didn't offer you enough, and therefore coinage had to be beautifully streamlined. But in fact, that was just Western arrogance because the local official mints could process any metal presented and ultimately produce coins at any known defined metrology. The refining system from antiquity called copulation had been mastered for centuries. That is, you could mine a metal, refine a metal, take a metal in its, in its refined state to a mint and make a coin out of that, out of any metal to produce a known percentage of mostly in this case gold and silver within that coin so it was very simple you could be sitting well taxilla we'll use taxilla have coinage come in from everywhere melt it down and produce your own coinage 
that was not a technological problem. And the next point is also very important, especially in the subcontinent, where there was a large population, there was a lot of money available, a lot of wealth. Mints were often large and technically skilled manufacturing enterprises that belie the etchings often shown for European mints. In European mints, what we often see is a couple of guys around a, around a fireplace swinging a hammer. In reality, if we looked at the major mints, say in Mughal times or even in Kushan times, well before that, mints were some of the biggest in the subcontinent some of the biggest industrial enterprises in the world. They may have had more than 100 people working in them and their limitations of size of production was how much molten metal they could lift, how, how long it would take to melt the metal, for example. They were huge enterprises, not the little things they try and tell us in Europe. And in fact, if we have a look at some mint sites that are available and we need to find a few more mint sites these days to really look at, they are quite large bits of architecture. Next slide, please. So here is a hand struck coin um, that is from a book that's coming up after our next book, The Coinage of Aurangzeb, in which we show with our original overlay um, scheme of colours, all the colours are interlocked from any series of coins around the world. The rulers will always be in red. Um, the mint will always, if there's a mint there in green, the dates will always be in certain colours, etc. Now, if you look at this coin on the top right-hand side, you'll see a hole punched in it. In India, they punched in the subcontinent, they punched holes. This was to see that it wasn't coated in silver and it didn't have a, um, the silver didn't cover, for example, copper. And copper was worth 1 70th or 1 80th of silver. So if you tried to uh, deceive people, you made a lot of money. But a comparative weight test could be done with a simple handheld balance and known weights. As I said, you had a little balance that could have fit in your pocket. You stuck a stone in there. Well, that's about, in modern terms, for a mogul rupee, 11.45 grams. Yep, that's good. <laughs> that's exactly what we want. A test for fineness could be easily done by a streak or touchstone test. The edge of the coin would be drawn across a piece of dark or black stone and a comparison made to a standard colour swatch. Accuracies of greater than one quarter of a percent of precious metal content were readily available in skilled hands. So if you got a coin you didn't know anything about, you could punch it, you could weigh it comparatively, and you could get someone to test it by drawing it across a stone. And it's just like a colour swatch. Silver of this content will look like this. And as I say here, you could get it within a quarter of a percent or better. If I could get it within a half a percent, experts could surely do much better than I could. And here I say the final test or punch mark could be applied to test the depth of the precious metal as a fi final test. This illustration shows the punch mark on the obverse, that's the front of the coin. And also there is one on the reverse, which is the back of the coin. Such test punch marks did not affect the weight of the coin because they were punched in and you could see a little fold of the metal coming up. So they didn't reduce the weight of the coin. Now, this is a coin, as I said, from the quite rare mint of Adoni, uh, in which there is inscribed on it what the uh, what Aurangzeb had inscribed on his coins. The date is 1098 Hijri, and it's the 30th year of his reign. And this is why collecting coins in India are so brilliant, especially in some eras like the Mughals, because you can have a mint like Surat that has 102 different dates to collect for Aurangzeb's reign and probably five or six different um, 
fronts and five or six different reverses. So collecting Serac coins would be a great deal of fun. Next slide, please. The reality of, of coins on Silk Road trade, again, and I know I'm repeating this, but this is for students of history and students of archaeology and students of art, etc. Because it all folds in together without coinage when they're introduced. No one could pay for things and industry couldn't really expand. We could not rely on simple barter to get to major places. Any coin was accepted along the silk trade. Even with technical expertise of money changes, many coins would have been unreadable. People in China could not read Persian. People in Persia couldn't read Chinese. People in Greece couldn't read, read any of those. The testing of coins and nominal comparative values was a simple process. Varying comparative values between different met metals could be a source of profit in trade. For example, the ratio of value of 100% silver to 100% gold in one area might have been 15 to 1, and in another area it might have been 12 to 1. So smart traders along a big territory might have been able to trade from one to another. The organisational structure of commerce along the Silk Road allowed for free and open trade. Now, there is a thing called Gresham's Law. Bad money drives out good. That means if I've got a coin that I want a rupee for and it's made out of half a rupee's worth of metal and another coin has got one rupee's worth of metal in it, people will hoard the one rupee of metal and give the cheap coins out. But it essentially did not apply in Silk Road trade. All coins could be accepted and valued by a known and accepted method system. Now, the significance of hoard finds. Now, for archaeology and history, people that make these, wow, look, we found this hoard, uh, hoard of uh, Kushan coins in Iran. Well, it's meaningless. Because coins were traded and everyone knew basically what they were worth, Instead of getting all excited about it, we've got to get the coins, we've got to look at them, we've got to work out the date, and we know the date from the, from the youngest coin that couldn't be put before that date, and we could examine them. And coins from any issuer could be easily recoined to a coin of any realm, and there is no real significance in such finds other than they were part of normal trade. Let's get our minds around and our history of trade, and this is where history is very important, instead of thinking, wow, you know, that was found 300 kilometres away from where it was minted, it could be found thousands of kilometres away because trade was, in fact, across the known world from a lot earlier than when coins were minted. Next slide, please. New pathway in coin metrology studies. Why is this important? Well, we've got some great new technologies and they're non-invasive. They can be done rapidly and I see I couldn't spell on that day. With the understanding that coins could be rapidly valued by competent people at the time of issue, regionally specific metrologies can be standardised. Metrology of coins must now include weight, metal type, as they do now and also how big they are, but percentages of contained metals. We can now analyse non-destructively and very accurately the percentage of contained precious metal. For regional series, a simple decision can be made for the metrology of the standard unit for each metal. And the standard unit in each metal, including billon, and billon is an admixture of silver and copper, and it is not a homogeneous admixture, it is heterogeneous until recently even the most competent XRF equipment had trouble examining it, but the modern stuff does not have problems. The standard un unit of metal including billon is described with the identity of 100. That is, one unit has 100 points. 
So you could pick any coin in any series in any metal and say, okay, this coin in a modern series weighs 11.5 grams on average. That's one unit. And therefore, in our coding, it's 100. Why do we have to know this? Because we have to give change. A series may consist of multiples and dividers of a unit. You can have two one units or, you know, instead of 100, it may be double that or it can be a tenth of that or a sixteenth. The metrology of a standard unit may change at any time in weight, physical dimension and metal fineness. That is part of the understanding. Next slide, please. Now, here are some tests that I organised uh, at the Ashmolean Mute Mu Museum with XRF, noting under full quality control methods. You never use a methodology of testing unless it's under full quality control and you know how to use the equipment. And people still decry XRF because they think you can just get one of the little modern XRF guns pointed and uh, what happens is it doesn't work. If you use it correctly and you attribute your coins correctly, it works. And this is uh, a series of coins that were tested across a number of mints. And basically it says the silver was about 95%. <clears throat> and have a look at how straight that line is. Excuse me. <coughs> and we're talking about coins made basically 450 years ago. So all across the subcontinent from then rule from Afghanistan, right almost to the base, they minted coins at 95.5%, give or take silver. So this goes back to the fact I was saying it could be tested, it could be shown, and there is just one set of proof over many thousands of coins tested. Next slide, please. Now, similarities, the Silk Road and the sub subcontinent marketplaces. What are the similarities? Well, the Silk Road covered many empires. The subcontinent covered many empires for much of its time. And the empires changed, grew, collapsed. Invaders came. They were pushed out. Other invaders came. But what we have to understand is the British had some pretty terrible views about what happened in India. And I'll just read a couple of notes that has, I believe, affected numismatic studies in India and practically sums up what the British kind of thought. In 1893, an appreciable advance was made in monetary reforms in fiduciary India. Notice fiduciary India. And as their rupee were easily counterfeited, and the advent of cheap silver had made their imitation a very pro profitable speculation, many of the rulers were impelled to accept the British rupee as a means of self-protection. Well, quite frankly, that's not correct. We can argue about that later. It has been estimated that during the first half of the last century, that's the 1800s, in addition to the half, do half dozen mintages which represented its official currencies at 30 or 40 others which from 10 to 50 percent below standard value these debased tokens gradually superseded the state rupees as the latter were bought up as fast as they were minted and were transmitted by speculative sellers to private manufactories of coins that were melted realloyed and issued as the numerous brands of money in circulation. It appeared that anyone who was prepared to pay for the privilege was permitted to mint rupees. Now, again, the British wanted to control the money. They wanted to make the money out of minting. So they're making up these stories that people in India were incompetent and were being ripped off. Well, I'm terribly sorry to say that that wasn't exactly true, but it makes good writing for the British. And however, no endeavour was made to recall and convert the numerous varieties of old rupees. They continue to circulate until quite recently, this is 1906 now, lakhs of them were in circulation. 
As the rupees were all handmade, they were easily counterfeited. Again, we might argue that. The official rate of exchange is 96 piece per rupee. A piece is a copper coin, the standard copper coin. At this time, somewhere between 10 and 13 grams of copper. But the public rarely obtained more than 86. Difference being absorbed by the money changers who having been accustomed for years to fix their own rates, they will not accept the government standard. That was a fact of business. Just like today, if I come to Australia and go to India, if I want to exchange rupees at the airport, I'll get about 37. But if I go down to Chandni Chope to my money changer, I'll get about 53. So in the, in the system, there are still so-called rip-offs. And in Australia at 37, that's a legal rip-off. So you're getting one third less rupees by the official route. So this British guy isn't talking much sense here. Even as late as 1906, the variety of copper coins pearl, piled up in heaps on market days in front of the, man, the money changes was fantastic. On examination, I have found specimens of Patan kings of Delhi, Brahmani kings of the Deccan, of Aurangzeb, of Akbar, of Tipu Sultan, and coins of various other types. Now, this is what I was... ...and finite value. And if you understood they had a real and finite value, what was wrong with using them? There was no real ripples because the marketplaces were highly and technically governed. And don't forget that you couldn't really ride off too far because people would chase you if you were going to rip them off. And because the marketplaces, even at the villages, were highly governed, Things were very, very carefully and well controlled. Next slide, please. Now, something weird happened only two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. My co-researcher, Tarek, showed me a picture of a coin. And we're working on John for Sultan, and it's our next book, quite revolutionary. It proves a number of our theories, and it shows some wonderful imagery by Tarek in the overlay system. The clarification of the decimalization of bill and coinage of Ibrahim Shah, John Paul Saltman. And I'm doing some work with Sri Ram College. So that's where the work is proceeding. Next slide, please. So here is this weird little coin that uh, Tarek found in a bulk lot for sale in uh, international catalog, I think I think this was in England. And all of a sudden, Tarek says to me, have a look at this coin. And I've gone, okay, well, it looks good. And Tarek said, well, it's pretty insignificant coin. And I said, yep, so why have you shown it to me? He says, well, it's Billum. That's the silver copper mixture. Billum was more um, worth more than, than copper, but less than obviously pure silver. Its weight's 0.91 of a gram. Its ruler is Ibrahim Shah and it's John Paul Saltman. Next slide, please. So, wow, look at what we've got. This is our work coming up. This is a one unit. Bill, 9.3 9, 9 grams. Next slide. And here is a four-tenths of a unit or two-fifths of a unit. Note the weight, 3.65 grams. Obverse and reverse. And the next one, the new coin in metrology, it is one-tenth of a standard unit. Its weight is one-tenth of the standard unit. It is now the smallest unit in the billing system. We now have a one, a four-tenths, and a one-tenth unit within the billing system. Change can be easily given for even small transactions within the billing system. If it costs nine, nine units or nine tenths of one unit, you can get a tenth change. If it costs six, you can give a four and two ones. So this fits in. Now, this has just been found. John Paul Sultanate, the Shiraz of, of India, was John Paul 
the system is decimalized at least within billing. So this is what has been found in the last two weeks. Next slide, please. It can be seen from comparison of the one unit and the 0.4 unit illustrations that the bill and coin uses the common obverse die for both coins and the reverse coin, the reverse die from the one unit coin. So wow, it fits in beautifully. Next slide. So how did this happen? And this is for all researchers. There was Tarek who is exceptionally good at what he does. Tarek understands metrology. Well, he's an accountant. It really helps when you're an accountant to understand how to count properly. And he and I had some joint discussions. Teamwork and fundamental knowledge. And in numismatics, the teamwork comes from history. It comes from epigraphy. It comes from uh, geology. It comes from metallurgy. Numismatics is not just one thing. It is a whole matching of study areas that whilst it can be on its own as one thing, it covers many things. Next slide. New pathways in coin metrology. The common names for coins often used in numismatic literature can be confusing and similar names can be used for coins of different metals and sizes. Someone can come up and say, look, I've got this tanker. It can be silver, it can be copper, it can be 20 grams, it can be nine grams. Ridiculous. The actual common name or any name may or may not appear on the coin itself. Most of the early coins never had a name on them, they weren't called rupees, even in Roman times. They still don't know the name in, in all the Roman coinage. The unit system, when utilised with the actual fineness of the metal and the weight produces a working figure for instant comparison of real value across empires. And in empires, India until recently was a group of empires where trade followed through and trade from overseas followed through. Contrary to popular thought, the marketplace could adjust rapidly to any change in metal content and weight. The corollary to the theorem is that the value of the coin reflects the metal content. And for this and the time and trade of the historic Silk Road and within the Indian empires was an accurate assumption. So if we all can bring it back to one basic denominator, we understand how the system works. Next slide, please. Non-invasive metal testing. I'll leave that slide there and just say, look, if you use XRF correctly, and in our upcoming book, uh, it discusses this and, and gives a standard operating procedure, wonderful discoveries are still able to be made by new researchers. Next slide, please. Trade on the Silk Road through India in its entire Length was highly organised and regulated. Coins of all types and issues could be accepted for payment in a reg well-regulated system. Coins of any metal fineness and type could be reminted to produce coins of any desired weight, design and metal fineness. Charges for the exchange of coins from one issuer to another or for reminting one coin into another were part of normal trade expenses, just as they are today similar to current buy and sell rates of currencies on the market today. There was, in essence, a known unit rate for currency, and that depended on its weight and fineness of contained metal. Hoard finds at various places along the Silk Road and the Indian subcontinent, while being of technical interest, are just part of the trade network rather than being anything extraordinary. Next slide, please. Future research, utilisation of quality control, non-invasive element, metallurgically, and my typing went haywire again, non-metallurgical testing by use of XRF to understand element composition of coins and other metals. And when you're looking, for example, of copper coins of Akbar, you can get 
it's so accurately now we can even go back and say okay well we're pretty sure this copper came from the main Rajasthan copper belt where the copper mines were multiples larger than even anything in that it, Europe has ever seen the copper mining and, and metal mining in Rajasthan was on an astonishing scale the interaction of various other areas of study such as metallurgy mining geology and economics with traditional numismatics studies to produce better research and connected catalog manuscripts and databases the utilization of better illustrations in numismatics, the use of the unit system of metrology to fully understand the ability for currencies to interconnect within a highly ordered transnational trading scheme that traversed the known world. That is, whilst we're looking in India and the subcontinent and the Silk Road, it can go anywhere. That's why they still find coins from... Um, the Arabic nations, Arabic silver, way up in Sweden. They were traded everywhere. Complete the understanding of the technical abilities of mints, especially in the greater Asian area. The technologies used in the mints was absolutely brilliant. And it really has to be brought out in research how great the mints were. And given the number of coins they produce was absolutely stunning. Next slide, please. Attribution. Now, I guess a lot of people were thinking, wow, he's going to talk about Kushan coins and he's going to talk about punch mark coins and mobile coins, etc. Well, I'm sorry if I disappointed you because that's the old way of uh, looking at numismatics. They, they, you know, they grab all the students and say, we're going to look at Kushan coinage. Well, how do you do that if you don't understand how coins are made, if you don't understand how coins were used? So numismatics and numismatic studies have concentrated almost from the first sentence on coin attribution. That's wonderful. We can get round to that when we understand what a coin is and how it was made and how it was used. We immediately become besieged with in-crowd terms like tanker, tanky, moha, for loose. Oh, it goes on. And the trouble is, you know, if you call, you know, a tanker, it can be a number of metals. We almost become besieged again by reports of hoard finds and spun tall tales about the wonders of finding Roman coins in Afghanistan or Chinese coins in Iran, when in fact this was part of the life of a coin. This is what happened, and it happened for thousands of years. People traded, and it happened before coins. And here is something for all you young students who believe in protecting things. To protect such finds correctly, all countries need innovative antiquities legislation based on that of the UK, specifically England. That's what needs to be taught in universities these days. Let's not beat up the person who found a couple of silver coins. We can work out a reward scheme and we can really look at them and we can make sure they're not melted down like 95% of them are in the subcontinent now. And lost forever. Often on archaeological dig, the coin that is found in situ is treated poorly and take it out of its context. And we lose history. And archaeologists are notoriously bad for treating coins badly. Next slide, please. Learning attribution skills comes after basic knowledge. There's one of our works in. Uh, one of our books of Jahan de Shah and uh, two books are being produced uh, at the moment and it's not showing up too well on my backing. We've got about 70 more to come actually. So we can learn attribution when we know what coins are and put them in real context and then historical context. Next slide please. Attribution studies are another story. Next slide. And this cunning lecturer has seen how bright everyone is here and so he's cut question time down a few minutes. <laughs> so that finishes what I have to say. So if there are any questions, please take pity on me. 
uh, hello are you listening me i sure am sir uh how we can uh, protect coins from denodation after the excavations uh vajib you are from pakistan aren't you yes i am from pakistan yes um, yes from the and you, and you are a specialist Karibu. you are a specialist in metals in our in our yes. study book that is coming out for sri ram course we have a section that is co-written by a number of world experts on coin conservation and how to treat coins that is a major subject that is that it is a number of lectures in themselves and there are different methods for gold silver billum copper tin and zinc because some of them suffer well gold certainly doesn't but silver and all the others suffer some problems and that's a special that's a special course but in our upcoming textbook it is shown in there and we work with a group in england uh that has all the uh necessary uh products to make sure that coins can be properly conserved so that is an important subject and thousands of coins have been lost in museums through poor conservation and thousands of coins are lost in collectors in india especially copper coin because of a thing called bronze disease but that is another section and that's a long discussion it's a good question mind you majeeb any other questions thank you so much uh yes sir we do have a couple of questions that we will be going forward with uh so the first question so we have seen rulers from central asia like the uh, shakas the kushanas who established their presence in india uh, but they were often cited into the quote and quote amlicha category so how far do you think the minting of coins with their portrait minted on them helped them legitimize their rule do you think that coins can be considered as the ideal carriers of their power and prestige even to the lowest section of the society that's that's the fundamental question on coins that what a great question when you were the ruler when after coins were invented what did you want to do you wanted to tell everybody hey I'm the boss on the boss and unfortunately in the old times most of the bosses were men so I've got to be a bit sexist here and say you know the king went out and said right I'm king I'm going to produce coinage I'm going to put my name on it but what was the problem with this in muslim countries muslim most muslim coins did not have images on so you had arabic or in india um, um from mogul times persian script which couldn't be understood but the fundamental thing rulers did was to produce coins in their name and this goes back to history why have we got this coin with this ruler's name on when he allegedly doesn't appear in history was he a potentiate was he a rebel or was he whatever the single authority and if we go into muslim times the authority was in katba he would recite that he was ruler in mint coins so i am saying i'm the boss i'm minting coins in my name and even in the great play about um well you call it the uh, first war of independence or the sepoys revolt i call it the british revolt in in 1857 in the play was written they were talking to uh shah alam uh, um the shah zappa and the, and allegedly the british said were you the ruler and he said of course i was a ruler it's my name on the coins so it was appreciated that if you have your name on the coin you are saying you are the ruler so what happens if you aren't the ruler the real ruler wants to kill you so minting coins is a sign of power either real power or rebellion so there in history where we join numismatics with history is what we read on this coin and the date we found it or where we found it does this accord with history and i'll tell you a silly thing that that we found in the asmolian test everyone ran and said look there's a there's a coin called the 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 bombay tin piece and i'd always said no it's not always made of tin it's made of zinc so we tested it and certainly from a specific date it was made of zinc 
And I said, well, the zinc came from India. Of course, they had the best zinc smelting in the world. Now they're saying the zinc came from China. So things can be found that are very important. And we have to look at history. And by the way, people who wrote their PhD theses on the tin trade to make the coins in Bombay out of tin when they were made of zinc, that's a problem for them. They didn't do their research properly. So if you find the name of a king on it, mostly it means something. Sometimes it doesn't. There has been recently a lot of talk about, wow, we found a coin of a new mogul ruler in the 1760s or 1770s because his name's on a coin. That was minted by some English idiot that's meaningless. So that can be, you know, dispelled. But some people are saying, wow, look at this mogul rule. So that question is the fundamental heart of numismatics and study. Does minting a coin mean I'm in the power? And I read those things out of the English book because the English were establishing their power by casting aside all the old coins. We'll mint a coin in the name of our emperor or empress and therefore we're the boss. That's why they didn't want any other coins. What a brilliant question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The second question is, the engraving of images was forbidden in Islam. But then why did Muhammad Ghori issue coins with the image of Hindu goddess Lakshmi on coins with bull and horsemen? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, horoscope signs on by uh, mogul rulers. Um, there were some images on Akbar coins uh, that were minted. Why did they do it? Well, I could ask one of the historians here why they think they did it. Why would a Muslim ruler put Sanskrit on a coin or why would they put Lakshmi on a coin? Is not that some sort of acknowledgement that, hey, I might be a Muslim, but these people are Hindu or in this area they're Jain or whatever. So there is there an acknowledgement. I will go against what my religion says. My religion says I shouldn't put images on a, on a coin. I should not make images. But for here, I will put an image there. And isn't that, and this is my simplistic Christian upbringing, working with a Tariq is, 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 is a Muslim and quite brilliant actually, and understanding Islam through there and talking with many of his friends who are Islam, understanding there was malleability there we'll show our you know people over here that we, we will put our um, um, our name on on it or we'll put their name on it that's my opinion we could go back and debate this for weeks but i think that just shows some accessibility uh, we have uh, professor nilama wanted to say something over to you ma'am Sorry. Obviously. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Trishti, and uh, thank you, Professor Needham. That was a very interesting lecture. And I just wanted to make a remark, if I may, about uh, Lakshmi. She is actually a civilizational goddess, not just a goddess belonging to the Hindus, but yes. she was also, uh, she's very much a Jain goddess, a Buddhist goddess. And she was there before we even had Hinduism properly, as we can see her depictions in, you know, Sanchi and Bharat. Yes. And I would think that uh, she was also looked upon as something like uh, bringing about good luck, you know, fortune. And uh, maybe that's why they, they, they Muhammad Kori, like you said, which came as a surprise to me because I actually didn't know that and um, that he may have issued. And besides the fact that he wants more authenticity with a certain section of people, and that would include, like I said, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, all of them. So that could be one thing. And the other question that I had is in the beginning of your lecture, you very clearly said that commerce could not be there without metallic, you know, without coinage. And uh, there's always this conundrum. There's always this problem within the civilization. And I know you may have grappled with it for a very long time. It must be a question that comes to you very often. But I would just like uh, you to comment on, on what you feel about in the civilization and what kind of coinage or money economy there was, because we clearly see it was commercially very, very active. Thank you. 
I started at the... This is one of those questions I had hoped to avoid. <laughs> Look, um, at the start of the lecture, I said, coins, you know, they're telling us coins started around circa 600, 650 before current era. I frankly don't believe this. I frankly believe that if we go into a very heavy section of research and get the archaeologists on our side, we do some more heavy research that we will find that there was a system of coinage in operation in a number of civilizations much earlier than 600 years before current era. And one of the things that stuffs up, pardon, I nearly said some rude words. I'm an Australian after all. A number of things that hinders our research is we have these bloody Europeans telling us, look, it started here. We, you know, we were there and it was the Greeks. And then we have all these subservient people and I run them. I run into them in India all the time. You know, we're going to look at this. Oh, no, we can't look at this because so-and-so has said this. I said, well, well, we should. No, 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 no. I'll get into trouble and no one will take any notice of me. And I, and I firmly believe that there was a system of something like coinage in operation for many years before 600, before current year. But because of pressures, and we see it in numismatics all the time. I remember five years ago in an open forum, I started to talk the economics of the price of copper rising during Orange Edge time. And I was basically booed out of the stage. Economics has got nothing to do with it. But hang on, he reduced the size of the coins by one third because copper rose in price or silver fell. Of course, economics has something to do with it and accounting does. So that's how we're kind of screwed up with not opening our mind. And that was one of the little reasons I threw in archaeologists don't look after coins on archaeology sites. They get a bit of metal, oh, this is a coin, throw it over here, we'll try and look at it later without often saying, and I've been on enough digs to understand this, not necessarily in the subcontinent, but certainly in Europe and in China, where instead of going, wow, this is in this sequence, and this sequence is 900 before current era, we've tested it, we have found something, and look, it looks like a coin. Now, this is why... I said earlier on, if we try to do very serious studies and very focused studies, there may be something quite brilliant not far down the track. So, um, unfortunately, I'm 72 years old, so I haven't got huge amounts of time left. But uh, sometime, hopefully, given that I had a grandmother that lived lived over 100 and my mother's 93, that I will live that long. In my life, I think we are going to make or someone is going to make a great discovery and it's going to come from somewhere in the Indian civilizations and probably in the north. Does that help you, Professor? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, the question now becomes is uh, when are we going to start this great search with proper support and funding and research but we'll talk later <laughs> any other questions yes sir. so um miss jaya gautam is asking considering the fact that every ruler would have brought his own coinage during war times or trade or at the time of exchange why would one ruler be accepting the coins of other where one may value theirs more than the other good question now you notice that I said coins in the marketplace. And earlier on, I said coins were minted to pay taxes and charges and fees. There are structurally two separate areas. And don't forget, in the subcontinent, we also had humble money, which was often carry shells or bitter almonds. So we had a lower section. In a general marketplace, there could be a coin and you can see coins of with many different stamps on them that have been in use for hundreds of years. There is a difference of coins that may have been used within paying government fees and taxes and being in the marketplace. We know, for example, that 
uh, in the Suri interregnum between Hamayan and then Hamayan and then Akbar, that Akbar did a huge amount of recoining of Suri coins into his own silver and into his own copper, for example. But there were still Suri coins being used in the marketplace in India in 1906 on the Deccan. So we have this structure whereby you want to get your own coins out, but if you're living in a village somewhere and the coins go round and round in circle, who cares who the ruler is? Rulers made coinage, struck them in the mints, and don't forget in India in Mughal times, we may have had 80 or 85 mints for a ruler. And they all produced brilliant coinage. Um, he pushed coins out because the ruling elite wanted to see his name and his support on the coins. It wasn't for someone like me who was going down to buy, uh, you know, a kilo of lentils or whatever passed for a kilo of lentils. I couldn't care less. What I couldn't read what was written on the coin. So it was a posture. I'm going to coin. Some rulers did bring in the coins. And a very interesting study in Mughal times, uh, Spanish silver by the time of Aurangzeb was the key coin in the world. But if you came, if you tried to trade outside, for example, Surat or Bombay or, or Madras, you could not carry Spanish silver coins. You had to have them reminted into silver rupees of, of the trade. So two things could happen. One, there were letters of credit called hoodies, which you could issue for one or two or hundreds of thousands of rupees, so you didn't have to transfer them. But if you wanted to pay a merchant, if you were a Briton, wanted to pay a merchant, and you had English or Spanish silver, it had to be reminted. The person in charge of the mint made a profit, and so did the ruler. So the moguls, for example, for standard international trade, you had to trade in coin of the realm. And that was a money making. And also at the time, if coins got more than three years old, for example, they lost value and had to be recoined. But that's in main trade. But if you're living in a village, no one cared. Because the coin went round and round in a circle for 300 years. And everyone knew how much the coin was worth. So we have all these nice little structures that unfortunately, our books, sure, they start with rulers. They're all rulers. But in reality, it's what the humble people did with the money that should drive our history. And it can drive it back through understanding the magnificent place that the subcontinent was. And instead of being this hotbed of rip-off merchants that the British like to say, but they said that about everyone except the British, um, it was just this wonderful structure. And this is where history and these understandings really has to now push. And I'm not talking... It's a sensitive subject about the Hindus were great or the Muslims were great or whatever. It is just that technically the whole marketplace ran brilliantly. Thank you. Sir. Hard, have we got an easy question? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's the last question now. Um, Good. <laughs> if in foreign trade, the value of the coin was determined by the metals, metals it was made of and not the markings then why bother issuing coins for foreign trade why not just use the metal or alloy directly instead of investing additional in the coin minting for foreign trade well coins may uh, there may be a misunderstanding here coins may not have been minted for foreign trade you know if if you're living in uh Shah Jahanabad, or Delhi, Shah Jahanabad, Old Delhi, and you decide to go up to modern uh, Kazakhstan on the Silk Road trade and you wanted to buy some whatever silk. You could take your coins and you could strike a deal and a bargain on the value of your coins that, you know, were written in Arabic or Persian or whatever or had images on it because they would test the coins now and see if they're real now what they might do is wait for the next trader from that area to come along or they might send it to the mint and pay a thing called seniorage which is the cost of you getting coins reminted the term is seniorage 
and you had taken seniorage in in discounting the value of your coin you know how much you were going to give because you may have had to have it reminted so what i was saying is you could take coins from anywhere and use them anywhere but whether they got traded back or reminted was up to the person who accepted the coin and that's why it's like coinage now and i was or money when i was saying how much i could get for trading australian dollars to rupees in australia it was 37 my mate at Chandy Choke, he was a, he's a nice guy. He gives me a lot more than that. It's just an element of trade and where you get the best value in trade. So, again, if I was a merchant, and that's why we find Roman and pseudo-Roman coins, for example, especially on the west coast of India and on the southwest coast, because Roman trade across the sea came down and they used Roman coins and they were copied down there as well. So they're still found, they're still found, they're still dug up. Well, this is a Roman coin of Caracalla. It's a silver coin. They were used in trade. So even back in Roman times at the start of the major Silk Road or that we know about, and Leiden University is doing some wonderful work at the Caracorums on the, on the Silk Route at the moment. Um, coins were just used everywhere and everyone knew what they were worth. And basically, everyone had to be honest because if they weren't, they would have been probably liquidated. And don't forget, transport was pretty slow. You might have had a fast horse, but it had to rest. So if you're ripping people off, you didn't last very long. And again, all of those great British stories that Rudyard Kipling wrote and some of the others about, you know, these nasty rip-off merchants. Well, they probably got those stories from what happened in England. And they just <laughs> decided that it was someone in in the subcontinent will will maybe will will maybe Marley or will will maybe Marmot or something else and you know it makes the story look good because they're evil, those people in the subcontinent. So that's my idea in any case. Um, thank you so much, sir, for answering all their questions. Now I invite over Somya. For the water Thank you, Ruby. On behalf of the entire Department of History and Team Zastan, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to our honorable speaker, Dr. Arthur Needham, for being here and enlightening us with such knowledge. Thank you, sir. Further, I would also like to thank our principal, Dr. Sandra Joseph, for letting us organize this event. I also extend my heartfelt gratitude to our convener, Dr. Amita Palival, and co-convener, Dr. Sanghamitra Rai Varman, for their constant support and guidance, without which this event wouldn't have been possible. I would also like to thank Dr. Nilima Chutkopekar, Dr. Soumya Vargas, Dr. Maya John, Dr. Richa Raj, and Dr. Tanu Parashar and Dr. Christo Doss for motivating us to organize this webinar in such a challenging time. I'd also like to thank both our presidents and vice presidents from the department and Dastan, and also the core teams whose effort go into making every event of ours a successful one. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank our lovely audience for being such patient listeners. We look forward to host you again in the future. Thank you and take care. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the session. The questions were extremely good. And I hope some joint work can come out of this and there's some knowledge imparted because there's so much work that can now be done and such expansive work and uh, it was great being offered this chance and I hope to contact some of you folks so perhaps some joint work can be done. So there's so much to do, quite frankly. Thank you so much. And Professor Pellywell, thank you for the invite. I've learnt a lot from this and as usual, the questions are always damn good. So thank you so much. Thank quite you so much, Dr. Yeah, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. In fact, I also had a question, but I hold it myself. So, you know, I'll be asking you on well, Facebook, which is well, related. That's fine. <laughs> to, 
<laughs> so I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help and there's a lot to do yes. and we need bright young people to do it. Old guys like me, thankfully I've had Tarek to kind of say, get your old ideas out of your head, let's go along this path. So there's a lot to be done and hopefully this has helped. Thank you again and I look forward to 